Thank you very much, Mick, and thank you, Vince. That's a great lead-in to our panel this afternoon to talk about some of uh, the real experiences of dealing in Southeast Asia, and particularly for our business, New Forest, and our fund, uh, the Tropical Asia Forestry Fund. Uh, I want to introduce our panel today. We've got a very diverse group here and plenty of experience across a number of different sectors. Firstly, Geoffrey Seto, who's not firstly, but in the middle, uh, Managing Director of New Forest Business in Asia, and he's responsible for the further expansion of our business and our company's presence there, and includes all management activities of our Tropical uh, Asia Forest Fund. Uh, James Bullen, who's sitting on the end. James has a, a lifetime of experience in forestry, having grown up in a family of foresters, first from Canada, but uh, spent his younger days in uh, Southeast Asia across uh, various logging camps and plantation projects. But uh, in his grown up years, he's ended up uh, 17 years as a forester, a lot of those with new forests in some very diverse locations, including Malaysia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Solomons, the UK, which obviously wasn't very tropical, but anyway, he's, he's got to the tropical part. Um, and then lastly, but not leastly, we have Glenn Samza, who is the co-founder of Plantation Management Partners, one of the first privately owned uh, property managers to conduct business in Southeast Asia. Uh, he leads the company's independent forest management activities for 40,000 hectares of plantation estate in Northern Australia and Cambodia and has over 20 years experience in forestry investment, management and science. So I might start with you, Jeff. You've got uh, over 20 years experience in Asia across a number of different sectors, uh, including infrastructure, natural resources, and uh, now in forestry, you're a very quick learner. You've come on board with New Forest, only been there a very short time. In your view, what's the recipe for institutional investors and what have some of, some of your lessons learned? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could start with some background and some of the history of your uh, investments in Asia. Yeah, okay. Uh, first thing I want to say is I think Vince, um, that was a great speech and I think he hit the nail on the head with, with some of the things that he said and I would certainly echo those and, and reinforce those in what I'm going to say. Um, but in my experience, I mean, I, I, I went to Asia in, in 1997 um, about eight months before the, the first Asian financial crisis. Um, and I think um, growing up in that environment or working in that environment up until 2008 um, has been quite eye-opening and we've certainly learnt a lot of lessons. Um, and then there is the post-2008 world, which I can go through in a little bit. Um, the first thing I would say about Asia is when people think of Asia, they think of sort of one homogeneous type of region. And, um, and I, I, I always tell people nothing could be further from the truth. Um, Asia is, is a very diverse set of countries at very different stages of development. They have different um, political systems, they have different cultures, they have different religions and, and, and so, so on and so forth. But in terms of the development, I mean, you've got, pip, you know, you've got countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, which are world-class, highly developed countries. You've got the less developed countries like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and then everything in between like China, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, and so forth. So, Notwithstanding that, you know, investing in across Asia, each country has its own nuances and, and things that you need to be aware of um, when you go into these countries. Yet, when you think of Asia, people think of China and Japan and, you know, the, the, the gorillas in the room. Um, and so there are interdependencies and obviously we're, Australia is part of that interdependency as you're seeing what's happening now um, with, the, with the slowdown in um, economic growth in China. But if I, if I, if I just, as some background comments, it, the way I think of it is post the 2008 world, so post um, the, the global financial crisis. As I said, Asia really had its crisis in 1997, and in 2008 they, they really didn't have a, much of a crisis. They were the fastest growing economic region in the world, and as a result of you know, uh, Fed policy, there was a lot of money that fl flowed into Asia from 2008 up until, you could argue, 2015, 16, and we'll see how that goes. But as a consequence of that, there's a couple of themes that have emerged, um, I think, and that is certainly what I've seen. Um, I think the private equity market, and when, when, and I'll talk about private equity later, but when people talk about private equity, um, the private equity market, which includes real assets, has really matured in the last, since 2008. I mean, I think you, if you see, if you look around and you look at the statistics, um, there's been more money raised in Asia in the last, you know, uh, eight years or so um, than, than at any other time. And so not only has more money been raised, the size of the funds that have, are raising that money have, have, have gotten uh, substantially bigger. So, you know, if they're characterised by larger funds, 
the larger funds are also having to put that money to work into larger transaction sizes. And one of the things in Asia is in terms of sourcing and originating deals is the ability of Asia as a developing market to absorb that sort of capital. And so what's that, what has, that has meant is a greater competition um, for secondary assets or brownfield assets as you call them because a lot of these private equity funds cannot do greenfield deals and so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that a bit, bit later. If you combine that with the low rate environment that we've experienced um, and so you, you, as, as Vince said, you know, most of the banks, local banks are, are pretty much flush with liquidity, um, vendors themselves and I'm talking about big family conglomerates, um, conglomerates in most of these countries um, are able to borrow more money. They have much more headroom in the debt. So from 97 to 2008, Asia had its crisis. Corporates, household balance sheets were in a deleveraging process. Post 2008, in a low interest rate environment, some of these companies have re-leveraged. In a more disciplined way, they've, they've not borrowed US dollars unhedged and all that sort of thing. But nevertheless, they've, they've, they've you know, raised significant amounts of debt to the effect that there's very little headroom left in their balance sheets. And I think what that's done is, as strategics, um, the, the level of M&A has also increased amongst themselves. And, you know, the conglomerates have gotten larger and they, they do everything from banking to real estate to plantation and what have you. And that's also led to a greater competition for assets. And so I think if, if, you, if you look at a post-2008 world, I mean, we, and I was, you know, I was, I was in private equity before this, and we thought that, you know, there'd be a correction in the market. It'd be great. You know, we'd better go in and buy some cheap assets, just like we've been able to do in Australia. Uh, but that hasn't really happened. In fact, I think the, the you know, the Asian stock markets by mid-2009 had recovered to their highs already. So it was the fastest bounce in history. So I think if you, if you have that sort of environment, um, in a, as we're now looking at a, at, a, at a world now where there is a prospect of a US rate rise, um, and whether that happens in December or March, or, or, and we can talk about that you know, offline, Asia has priced in a rate increase, and you're seeing this in countries like Indonesia, you're seeing this in countries like Malaysia, um, you're seeing it in the currency, in the depreciation in the currency, you're seeing capital flight back to um, less risky countries, safe havens, risk off, risk off sort of transactions. And that, in, an, in a rising interest rate environment, will start causing stress on some corporate balance sheets, um, especially the family companies that have borrowed against their assets to, to fund CapEx expansion in maybe real estate and other things. And now they want to monetize, um, now they want to, they're looking at their forestry assets because you know, they typically hold concessions as well, and thinking, well, we're, we're, you know, I need more money to expand and build that next plant and equipment or whatever for my factory, what do I do because I can't borrow any more money? So what they're doing is they're seeking to, and, and I hope this is going to manifest itself because that's the platform that we're, we're in Asia for, but um, they're seeking to unlock some of the value in their balance sheets. And the way they're going to do that is, is to sell, sell off parts of some of their assets, and typically on the real asset side because there's the, 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 the relatively lower return type assets for those guys, and, and recycle their capital into, into other things. And so, I mean, if you, if, you, if you have that context, then, you know, going forward, I'm cautiously optimistic that, you know, whether or not valuations are going to correct in a great way, you're at least going to see opportunities and you're going to see the potential for more transactions to come to the market. And you're going to see vendors who are more willing to let go partially, some, maybe, maybe all, of, their, of some of their forestry and real assets they have on their balance sheet. Jeff, you've yeah. talked there about the sources and where that you know, looks like where the investments are going to come from in the future. What do you think the best strategies and structures are going to be to, to make those investments work going forward? Okay, well, I, I mean, I think Vince hit it on the head. I mean, when I, when I look at Asia and you, and you look at the sources of deals, um, potential sources of deals, you have, things, you have governments that are seeking to, to privatise some of their assets or you have governments seeking, seeking partners to bring global best practices in um, not just for forestry management, but for environmental sustainable sort of systems, governance, that sort of thing, and, and obviously new forests, and that's the platform we invest in. Um, on top of that, you've got these integrated wood product companies, multinationals, pulp and paper, that have tried to control their upstream by investing in estates or properties in Indonesia, and, and mainly Indonesia, but you know some other markets, that have not been able to realise the dream, or not been able to realise economically 
um, mainly because they may, may, they may not be able to manage the, uh, the local communities or maybe they just don't know their way around, um, around the landscape. Um, and then the last thing is you have the local families, uh, conglomerates, um, the corporates that, um, you know, that, have, that have these, what we call, it's all concession based, but concessions or forestry concessions sitting on their balance sheets. And if this sounds like you know, the US TMO market 30 years ago, there, I mean, there are definitely parallels to that. And this is you know, how it all started. Um, and so for an institu institutional ownership in, in Asia is, 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 is very, very low compared to the US and, and, uh, and, and Australia. And, but the difference is we've had 20 years of experience now of seeing what's going on. We're, we're in a world now where you know, the, it's much more environmentally aware that people want to drive sustainable forestry, plantation forestry, because in Asia they realise that you, know, you can't keep harvesting natural forests because we're going to run out of that. So, so Jeff, how do you yeah. differentiate yourself then in, in that marketplace oh, as a great investor? I'm probably talking a little bit too much. But I think uh, as in terms of differentiating ourselves, what, what we bring to the table, and in, in a new Asia it's, it's not enough to bring a bag of cash and, and plonk it on the table because you know, liquidity is quite abundant and, and vendors are used to that. Uh, the value proposition for us is you know, the, the abil our ability to, our shared value concept, our ability to deal with communities, we drive environmental standards, we drive you know, sustainable standards and governance standards in these companies. And it's, it's not just shared value for communities and our investors, but also for our partners. So partnering up is, is, very, very, is a key thing. Local partners help us to mitigate risk and a source of transactions, but also the, the expertise that we bring in allows them to be able to access a greater pool of foreign capital in a, in a market now where foreign capital is starting to, or local capital is starting to dry up, and to bring in world-class standards to, to, to how, they go, how they're governed. Can I just ask uh, James yeah. uh, for your opinion in relation to uh, opportunities in, in Southeast Asia, and where do you see the best value coming from in the next 10 years or so? Uh, thanks, Kim. Um, the, the, the real opportunities in Southeast Asia are um, probably more about the higher value uh, forestry assets. Um, there's been a lot of investment, uh, mainly by industrial players, more on the pulp and pulp, pulp, pulp plantations and, um, and short rotations. And I think um, the view of the sort of more longer term uh, view in terms of getting cash and value of assets hasn't really um, hit Asia yet. Um, but that's now starting to change. Um, so I see the real opportunities in some of the, as, as people have touched on before, um, the opportunities are some of the moribund sort of government assets and some of the green on greenfield sites uh, where people take a more longer term, are starting to take more of a longer term view um, on investing in forestry. Um, so the, I mean, Asia still has huge opportunity and potential. Um, it has much better, as people were discussing earlier, it has very good growing conditions um, and relatively low cost base. Um, but you know, where, it, where it's fallen down in the last 20 years is the sort of technical um, and management and um, opportun opportunity to maximize that biological growth. Um, and you know, in a relatively short term, uh, you could see substantial returns um, um, on a value of assets uh, once you implement the right management, um, looking at the right species and silviculture. Um, though there's been quite a lot of work on the pulp side of the things, um, certainly on the, on the solid wood side of things and higher value uh, timber products, um, it's very much lacking. And, and that's, that's a huge opportunity. I mean, I think if you look at Brazil, 20 years ago, that's really where Southeast Asia is today. Um, now the key to really unlocking all of that is management and the right team on the ground. And that's a challenge. And it will be, I mean, f to have successful investments in Southeast Asia is to have the right, the right managers and teams on the ground. And that's not necessarily just importing managers from Australia and New Zealand or South Africa. It's actually finding the right guys locally, building them up, and, and getting them working with your joint venture partners and the local communities, things like that. 
I might just ask Glenn, who's had now a number of experience, uh, years experience in Cambodia, and that's obviously been something that you've been working on. Could you just tell us about your experience there and how you've been able to drive the change that we're hearing is needed in Asia to, to drive value? It, it has been a challenge. Um, James talking about uh, poppled crops and going moving towards more higher value um, crops. Uh, we find management and labour are, are really familiar with those sort of silvicultural regimes. Um, we need to invest a lot of time and effort in, in training local staff and our labour in terms of the new techniques, new technology, um, you're starting from the nursery right through to you know weed control techniques, pruning and, and other silvicultural techniques. So we invest a lot of time in that. Um, and, and depending on where you operate as well, um, you, 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 you're sort of coming from where we, we, we tend to throw tractors and machines at doing things. Um, we, we have labour in South East Asia to do a lot of activities. Um, Cambodian project, for instance, has um, up to 500 people at any one time out in the forest. Um, so we're, we're constantly having to look at how our labour works, um, making sure they're well fed, well watered, um, so we can, we can maintain um, the productivity um, and ensure that the cost, effective, cost effective, effectiveness is there because um, there is going to be that substitution. So some of the activities we do undertake using tractors and, and the like. So it's quite challenging compared to, say, an operation in Australia. James, I might just go back to you in terms of um, the social and communities consideration and some of the experiences that you've had, um, the investments that we do have in Asia and how you're managing those. Um, yeah, the, the, the ESG side of the investment in Southeast Asia is, is critical to the success um, and um, it's, it's not such a way of looking at it as um, a value add um, in terms of whether you can sell credits, environmental credits and things. But we, we take a look at that. Um, you might have a concession of uh, 50,000 hectares and on, on the piece of paper that's yours. Um, but in reality, um, there's uh, local communities, encroachers, um, potentially other businesses operating on that land. Um, so we uh, take a very much approach of mapping that out, working with the communities, building up relationships, um, and it's it's a slow process. It takes time. Um, potentially, the previous owner, owners, or, or um, other organisations have, have, have developed other ideas of those communities, and there can be quite often tensions. Um, but it's about building up their trust and. Um, showing that the business can be part of the community um, and such things such as developing their skills so they can become contractors um, not and uh, them not requiring to encroach and doing shifting agriculture within your concession so much because they've got uh, alternative means of income. Um, and ultimately I think that, that the real value of this become on the asset comes down much further down the chain um, as, as we would plan to exit. Um, the, the ways to view it is you de-risk that asset in terms of social community side of things and you've added, uh, you've got other value add and new investors coming in would see that um, that asset is a much more secure land base and, and stable asset and you, um, our view is that you'd start to get some discount compression on those well-managed, well-described assets with integrated social um, management systems uh, working with the communities. Glenn, just back to you very quickly. Could you explain um, potentially how the relationship between the asset managers and the property managers works in Asia compared to, say, Australia and New Zealand? Do you find it's a much closer relationship? Uh, could you give us a bit of background on that? Yeah, property management uh, in Southeast Asia and the opportunities that it presents property managers are quite different to ANZ. Um, it ranges from people, organisations like ourselves, um, having seconding employees into the portfolio companies and providing executive management services through to probably um, the model that's in ANZ is just providing management teams to manage the assets um, right through to providing managers and labour. So um, right through the, right through the, the chain. 
Um, so th that that represents, you know, the, those three different sort of models represent different challenges. Um, regardless, given given the assets um, and the and the change that needs to be undertaken, um, there needs to be a really close relationship between the asset manager and the property manager. Um, and um, my experience is that the asset manager tends to be a lot more hands-on, and uh, it's a really good relationship. Yeah, ha having worked um, both uh, managing funds in Australia, New Zealand, and in Asia, um, the way New Forest approaches it, because the management is so critical um, on the ground, um, as a fund manager, we, we actually are a lot more integrated and understanding of more of the day-to-day -day things in the asset and, and in the assets. Um, I mean, as touched on earlier, the corruption and bribery thing is a very sensitive issue for us. So we're very uh, uh, hands-on, wanting to really understand internal management systems and processes, how they control and manage potential uh, uh, corruption and side of things. Um, but also just a little bit more on their HR systems and processes um, and managing worker welfare, we will be a lot more involved in understanding that because until we feel that there is a, uh, a well-developed property management uh, contractors and, and management within Southeast Asia, we feel it's our responsibility to be actually more um, cautious about what's going on within the businesses. One of the things Vince mentioned was the um, unavailability of data and trying to, to pull information together. And I think, James, you've touched on the, the process of mapping and, and understanding what it is that we do have. Would you like to comment a little bit on that in terms of uh, the challenges that you faced with, with some of that information gathering? Yeah, I, th I think, um, well, the, on an operational side, um, the challenge is um, there isn't very much. <laughs> so, um, so it's a question of um, building your, ex you know, pulling on your resources that you do have in the region, um, and but also um, developing um, systems and processes that you can start collecting data, um, and then even more importantly, educating the managers, the local managers, and understanding, um, getting them understanding of the importance of the data, and uh, educating them that. You know, what a institutional investor is looking at um, a lot of um, the early sort of um, industrial plantation players in Southeast Asia is very much more about cost, and so um, you know they, they were limiting some of their operations because of it, it wasn't required. But in terms of a overall long-term strategy, it was you know, it was value decreted. So it's all about um, educating and building up those data systems and management systems. It takes time. Um, there are there are different ways of doing things. Um, um, Australia, New Zealand, you can fly planes, take aerial photography, do lidar. Um, well, the Indonesians and Malaysians don't like you flying planes and taking photographs. So there are other ways of doing it. So, um, but it it is all about education and getting that management team up to spec uh, and cross training. I just might add there, and, and, and I think, as, as you said, because of the lack of data, um, due diligence is, when you do diligence on a project, it, it's, it's absolutely key, and, and whatever, whatever dollar you spend on diligence, you, you'll save you, it'll, it'll, it'll save you or make you $10 you know, in, in a few years' time. And I think as part of that process then, the diligence will take you into to negotiations, and most deals you will do, and most deals you'll do in this sector will require you to have a partner. And partnering up is the absolute key to successful investment in Asia. And I, I completely echo what Vince says. Only it's, it's part of a risk mitigation process because they know their way around. Um, and it's a win-win because you bring in your, your best practices, your forestry management systems and your environmental systems. So as part of that negotiations, from the diligence will tell you where the gaps are. It will tell you when, you, you, when you're doing your, your analysis, and it will allow you then to embed some of these things into, into the agreements that you have with your counterparty. So in terms of when you're talking to your counterparty, um, one of the things that has been brought up you know, quite a lot here is you know, whether or not a private equity type 10-year fund structure is suited to forestry investments in Asia. And I'm in the camp where you know, we, we do need longer term vehicles, if not permanent capital vehicles, and from two points of view. So, I mean, I think um, Anders 
came from the, the side where you know you have asset liability matching, and I think Gerity came from the side well, you know rotation is 12, 15 years for a tree. Why do I, I have a 10-year fund? And if you do a greenfield deal, which we have, we are looking at one. We're not going to get to see one harvest unless we have a longer fund life. So there are those things, but. To, you can't discard the whole private equity concept because some of the private equity instruments that you use are very relevant in Asia. It's well understood concepts. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. If you're, if you're talking to a potential vendor, and obviously vendors will think, have, have a higher valuation idea in their head than, than what you're willing to pay um, as an institutional investor. And so you, use, you, you have private equity instruments to be able to help you to bridge that gap. And you know their expectations are unrealistic, but they don't believe you because they think that, you know, their soils are more fertile or they can achieve 30 or 40 MAI, MAI on, you know, land that you're probably only going to get 18. So as an, as an example of what we've done in, I've done in the past is, and it's, it's not that, you know, complicated, but, you know, you put a, if you put a convertible bond instrument in there with some sort of, you know, conversion at a time in the future when, when um, you know, the profitability is up or what have you, uh, or you know some of the, the things that he says is going to happen actually does happen, then that helps him to bridge that gap as well. And so there are some there's, there's sort of it, it's there are a lot of these different types of instruments and um, that that allow you to help bridge gaps, that allow you to get the sort of minority protections that you're going to need if you're in a minor, in a minority interest, and that's going to be quite characteristic for a lot of transactions. Um, Asian vendors don't really like to give up any equity or be diluted, let alone majority control, um, and so. That, that helps you get the protections that you require to be able to drive your standards um, and, and, and move forward um, and adhere to anti-corruption standards, adhere to your ESG standards, and gives you some sort of operational control to drive your, your forestry controls and stuff through. So, I mean, that's part of it. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. I just want to go back and touch a little bit on governance. It's a yep. fairly important uh, sure. topic, and we've all sort of talked a little bit about bribery and corruption. Glenn, uh, your organisation has a no tolerance policy. How is that actually impacting you on the ground in, in forestry in Cambodia? Uh, it, this no doubt uh, does impact on operations, just in terms of getting local approvals and um, just some of the regulatory um, uh, day to day dealings and say six monthly reviews we, we do have to it does take a bit longer um, that's for sure um, i haven 't come across anything that's overt um, it's it's more that you know it doesn't pass the reasonableness test so um, we work very hard with our staff around training um, to identify any issues and um, yeah it it really comes from the top down. The asset manager um, articulates it to the higher levels of government and then we've just got to feed it through to the provincials and districts and villages. And are you noticing a change? I'd like to think yes. Um, the, the difficulty that we do face, and we've got to be realistic, is that uh, a lot of these levels of local government, at least, are unfunded. So you know, to get them out to do an inspection so you can get your planting permit or whatever the case may be. I, I think it's reasonable to provide f food and fuel because, you know, they don't have funding to do that. So, you know, those things we can deal with. We keep a register and, you know, that's all above board. But um, so we're winning on that level. Um, um, and I think the more we see the likes of new forests come in, um, private equity, US, you know, institutional funds, will, it'll, it'll, it'll get better. Mm -hmm. James, do you want to make a comment on that? Because that's something, obviously, with the operations on the ground, uh, all the way from the top down, uh, from investments right through to contracts on the ground that you're dealing with. How have you seen things changing since the time you've been in Asia? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've done a fair bit of work in Asia, and I've seen a fair few things that I probably couldn't repeat here. Um, <coughs> I, I would say that um, people are used to international investors coming in and, uh, and understand that we have different principles than maybe what they have. And I think the way it, at the moment it's working is that um, if they understand that you have a zero tolerance, they accept that. But then they might go and do business with another local entity and all sorts of things can happen. So I, I think that's the way. And I think it, you set the record straight from day one 
and um, I, you can do business in Southeast Asia. You need robust systems and processes, and that's really important. And from time to time, you, within your organisation, you may come across it, and you just have to um, act on it rapidly, and the message gets out there. Um, that usually at the beginning, there's a few sort of testing. They're just pushing to see how far they can push it, and if you re work on it, uh, react to it very quickly, um, you can usually stop it. Great. All right, well, I think we're out of time. I'd just like to uh, ask you to join me in thanking the panel. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.